Tonight, on Campaign Countdown, we will look at the issue of local political signs being stolen and vandalized. Jillian Freeland with a presentation on women's health and reproductive rights. County Commissioner Keith Baker talks about affordable housing solutions. In Pam's Planning, Pam will explain why your dropped off ballots are safe. Lori Boydston does a presentation on Women's Equality Day. We will have excerpts from an interview with Jennifer Swasina about the Nestle's bottled water controversy. And Chafee County and County Commissioner candidate Hannah Hanna babbles on with her only solution to every problem. This is Campaign Countdown. I do have a hard time because I am more about smaller governments, and so it is a concern to uh, see that we're expanding yet again another area of our government. You know, I do have a hard time because I am more about smaller governments, and so it is a concern to uh, see that we're expanding yet again another area of our government. You know, I do have a hard time because I am more about smaller governments, and so it is a concern to... Uh, see that we're expanding yet again another area of our government. You know, I do have a hard time because I am more about smaller governments, and so it is a concern to uh, see that we're expanding yet again another area of our government. Hi, I'm Jillian Freeland. I am running to represent you in Colorado's 5th District. My journey and my passion for reproductive health started when I was just a kid. My, I grew up in a very conservative household and my parents decided that attending a sex education course was not a good idea for our, their children. Uh, they pulled myself and both of my sisters out of the program. And because I'm the kind of person that you don't tell me I can't know something, marched myself down to the library and ended up learning a lot more than my peers did in their class. <laughs> and, and thus began my mission to educate people about their bodies and to make sure that we all know our rights. I have since become a certified professional midwife. I provided uh, home birth services to women in the Congressional 5th District for about two years. As Eileen mentioned, or as Ellen mentioned, excuse me, I have, uh, I, I got frustrated because uh, insurance companies do not want to pay for coverage. And unfortunately in this country, there are an awful lot of legislators who also don't want to allow women to have contraception. And what's really wild to me is that these same people turn around and pass legislation against abortion. And so you take away the tool that helps people prevent pre pregnancy and then turn around and try to penalize them for accessing abortion. That's not acceptable to me. I have been a volunteer with Planned Parenthood the day that Robert Deere took a weapon and murdered people here in our own community was devastating to me. I had just given birth to my oldest daughter and I still have a really hard time talking about this topic because healthcare centers like Planned Parenthood provide such a myriad of services and in actuality prevent many more abortions than they perform. And so anyone who wants to take away the ability for a woman to decide if she gets pregnant or if she stays pregnant is not acceptable to me. I <clears throat> decided to go into Congressman Lamborn's office one day to share my experience as a healthcare provider and to discuss with him that you know, I know that he is personally a very pro-life individual and that I wanted to share with him the ways that he could actually impact women's health care and make everyone safer and also make sure that uh, the power was in the hands of the woman. Then his staff was not receptive to hearing anything that I had to say and that is ultimately why I decided to run for office because this is just one of many fronts where we have people writing health care legislation that do not understand either the physiological processes behind reproduction or behind determining someone's gender or they would rather have an ideological argument about people's bodies without backing it up with action that actually provides the power that they are purporting. Uh, and so I, I have followed with ever increasing alarm 
the legislation that has been passed over the last few years and watching the number of lifetime judges appointments that are being made by this administration. And I am very afraid for my daughter's future. And so when we see things like legislators in Ohio writing laws that require a physician to perform an impossible medical procedure, this person proposed and passed a law that was written by a lobbyist without reading it, without researching it, and this legislation threatened physicians with prison time if they did not attempt to reimplant a tubal pregnancy. That is not possible. And this is why healthcare legislation needs to be written by medical professionals. It needs to be based in evidence and best practice. And this applies to the entire scope of medical care. And so as we move forward, we have a very long fight against us. Like I said, these judicial appointments are lifetime appointments. Many of the individuals who have been appointed are young, so they are going to be our judges for decades. And so having a legislator in, in office like me who understands reproductive processes and rights is going to be critical, but we are also going to be fighting this on the judicial side for many, many years to come. And so Irene's experience on, on, the, on the forefront of advocating to maintain these rights is going to be critical, and I hope that you all will join in in making sure that we all still have these rights so that when my daughters are adults, if they don't want to have a baby, they don't get pregnant. Or if they get pregnant and they don't want to be, they don't have to stay that way. Chaffee County is working on creating a multi-jurisdictional housing authority to address our critical housing needs. Um, this actually, this action came about in 2016 with a housing needs assessment that clearly pointed out the quality of life dangers we face because our workforce might need to live outside the county and come into the county to work. We've got rapidly rising housing costs. We don't have much inventory in affordable housing. So the question is, what would you do to increase our supply of workforce housing for current commissioners? That might include what you're doing right now. This is a two minute question and we'll begin with Hannah. On single lots. Thank you, Greg. Keith, you would come next in rotation. Okay, thank you. Uh, rather than repeat a lot of the things that Greg said, which were, were spot on, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different approach to this. Uh, this really illustrates the importance of trying to anticipate problems and getting ahead of them and start working on them well before they uh, make it to crisis point. And what I mean by that is if we had started working on this 12, 15 or so years ago when the first housing needs assessment came out, we might not be in the pickle that we're in right now. A lot of these things require a big, heavy lift. Uh, they do require capacity building. We did form the HPAC. We hired a housing director in, in the form of Becky Gray. We had to educate ourselves. We became aware of private activity bonds, lots of different funding mechanisms. And now we're just now poised to really do some meaningful work on this. Uh, Collegiate Commons was a major project. There were lots of moving parts. There were land swaps between the town of BV and the school board that helped make that happen. Uh, we had a couple of fits and starts, but we persisted and we made it happen. Um, right now, you know, there were people even as little as two and a half, three years ago said, we don't really have a housing problem here in Chapey County. And the only problem that we have, the private sector can solve. Well, the private sector is good at addressing a lot of things, but they won't address 80% and below AMI affordable housing. It takes public-private partnerships to do that. And that's what the county is really good at helping facilitate. Uh, we're still behind the power curve. We still have a long way to go to generate the housing stock we need. But the comprehensive plan and looking at increasing densities rather than trading one problem for another, putting affordable housing way out in the middle of the county and turning it into a transportation problem, but then looking at uh, the densities around the perimeters of the municipalities where we can extend services, drive construction costs down, and make the construction costs less so that the housing is more affordable. Those are the sorts of things that the uh, that government and the private sector can work together on to solve the problem. Thank you. Bon you know, I do have a hard time because I am more about smaller governments, and so it is 
concern to uh, see that we're expanding yet again another area of our government. You know, I do have a hard time because I am more about smaller governments, and so it is a concern to uh, see that we're expanding yet again another area of our government. You know, I do have a hard time because I am more about smaller governments, and so it is a concern to uh, see that we're expanding yet again another area of our government. You know, I do have a hard time because I am more about smaller governments, and so it is a concern to uh, see that we're expanding yet again another area of our government. Welcome back, everyone. We are back in the bunker and we're going to do some more Pam explaining. Today's topic is going to be Are drop boxes safe? Are drop boxes safe? Heck yeah, they're safe in Colorado. Under Colorado law, they're secure, they're monitored, they're under 24 hour video surveillance. And we're under strict ballot custody regulations and we've developed our plan and processes with bipartisan teams of judges documenting the collection um, and return to the central processing station. So you can be assured that the 24 hour drop boxes are monitored and secure um, and um, dealt with in a bipartisan nature. And they're, uh, it's not like we just open them and then empty them on election day. They, uh, we are emptying them multiple times a day. Um, like Pam says, we have the video surveillance and if there are any issues, we can always go back to the videotape we can, uh, we can pinpoint the last time that somebody was at that collection box. And, and this is regardless of how big the county is or how small the county is. Those ballots come out of that box every single day. So feel very safe and secure about dropping your ballot in a ballot drop box. We've already been doing it for years and years and years uh, and with no issues. So please don't feel like you can't drop your ballot in the 24-7 box. We also have staffed options drop boxes in the vote centers, at the elections office, and other locations. You have drive-through voting, drive-through drop-off in some jurisdictions. So check your ballot instructions in your mail ballot when it comes back, and it'll give you exactly the locations you can find them. You can look at um, county clerk websites as well, or um, look yourself up on gogocolorado.gov. Go, go, go Pam, also, um, you know, every election, you know, and even for myself with my elderly family members, I do uh, go and get their mail ballot um, and bring it back to the office and, and uh, turn it in. Uh, should, what should people know about uh, if people are trying to come and collect their ballots? So under Colorado law, an individual can legally collect and support up to 10 ballots for an election cycle. So that's more than one election. It's not a lot of ballots. You may be approached by someone knocking on the door asking to collect your ballot if you're ready. We have voters that are some, sometimes um, not sure whether or not they should do that. Voters have the power. You do not have to give your ballot to someone you don't know. We have multiple locations, but if you have a family member, if you're assisting someone, just know that there are restrictions on how many you can collect safely and legally. And um, as a voter, you have the power to decide. You have lots of options available to you. So if you're not comfortable with it, use your own, your own judgment on that. Use your own judgment and you, you can always call uh, your trusted source for information, which is your county clerk's office, your elections office. They are the trusted source. If you have any questions about whether you should uh, you know, give your ballot up or not, you can certainly contact them. Also remember that if you do give your ballot to someone, you can track your ballot online with ballot tracks. Check your county clerk websites for information on a link to that. You'll be getting automatic messages um, pushed out statewide on when your ballot's received in the event that you have any concerns around it. And if you don't have access to the internet, you can certainly call your local ele elections office mm -hmm. and they will be able to tell you when they received your ballot. Okay, thanks Pam.
all of the things that you need to be able to run. And 50% should be, 51% should be representing. I know a lot of it is not at that point yet. We can keep working toward it. But we also need to make sure that we're not voting for women just because they're women. We have candidates that are absolutely exceptional that are men, and that's who you vote for because they are exceptional. And so we're here at 100 years, and uh, women are a little behind. Let's keep fighting to make sure we can keep representing the people. And I plan to do that when I get to the State House for House District 60. House District 60 is Chaffee County, Custer County, Fremont County, and Park County. And um, the people here need broadband. Everybody needs access to broadband for business, for communication and absolutely for education now, which is what COVID has shown us. So I will be um, studying, pushing that issue. I do have a hard time because I am more about smaller governments. And so it is a concern to uh, see that we're expanding yet again another area of our government. You know, I do have a hard time because I am more about smaller governments. And so it is. Hello, I'm joined by Jen Swasina. She's a spokesperson for the local grassroots group known as Unbottle and Protect Chafee County Water. Hi, Jen, how are you? Hi, Steve, thanks for having me. So I understand this group was formed to oppose Nestle's permit renewal to operate in Chafee County? Yeah, that's right. Um, we're just uh, started out as a, as a few people um, and now we've grown to almost 700 folks on our um, Unbottle and Protect Chafee County Water Facebook wow. page. Um, you've probably seen some signs around town, um, <laughs> letters to the editor, gaining momentum. Uh, Nestle Waters is a multi-billion dollar multinational uh, corporation with quite a, quite a track record and a reputation worldwide uh, for humanitarian and environmental abuses. Um, so once folks got it on their radar that there's a permit renewal coming up, uh, people are, are starting to, to get active in opposing this permit renewal and it's, it's voted on by the commissioners on October 20th and 22nd. So coming up soon, it's time for people to get involved, huh? Right, yeah, and it's a complicated issue. So it's a lot to, to, to learn and uh, I'm happy to uh, spread, spread the word. We came up with a, a declaration of denial. Uh, there's eight points on that. Um, so trying to just kind of break it down for folks, um, to have some talking points when, when, uh, writing to the commissioners or showing up at the public hearing. Well, I'm going to talk about the document of denial, uh, really soon, but I, I just wanted to ask, can you tell me sort of how, I mean, you, you're, you're personally sort of the, uh, if not the spearhead, sort of the, the main rabble rouser in this, uh, this situation, can you can you sort of just give me a little background on how you got involved personally and why this is uh, as important as it is to you? Well, to me, I, there's so much going on in the world right now. It's a little overwhelming and can feel, you can start to feel helpless that there's nothing you can do. Um, there's the fossil fuel industry and global um, climate change and corporate corruption in our politics and plastic pollution and um, so to me, Nestle sort of represents all these things and it's happening right here and right now. Um, so I feel like it's the whole thinking globally, acting locally, um, idea gives sure. me, um, a feeling of, of purpose that I am doing something in these historic times, um, rather than just kind of sitting by and, and feeling like there's nothing we can do. So to me, it, it gives me a, a sense of bigger picture purpose um, yeah. and, and it's within our sphere of influence. And it's, and it's time sensitive. I mean, the time to act is now on something like this since they're uh, up for, for renewal. Let's, uh, let's go over the, um, let's talk a little bit about the document of denial. Let's go over the eight points that you made in the document, document of denial, excuse me. And that's found on the website called nestleave.org. Um, the first one, 
The first item is that Nestle Waters should not be allowed to operate on land of statewide interest. Can you uh, expand on that? Yeah, so the, Nestle does have a junior water right and they own land, um, but they need to have a permit. It's called a 1041 permit to, to basically operate this commercial, this giant commercial um, operation. Um, the idea behind the permit is to mitigate their impacts. And um, one of their um, criteria and their permit and their 1041 permit is that they need to prove that their operation is more beneficial to the county than, than uh, the losses to the county. Right. Um, so that's something that it, it's kind of a, a no brainer that taking water out of our aquifer, trucking it to Denver, putting it in plastic water bottles, uh, and selling it back is is not a, a beneficial operation. Um, and the permit was uh, approved 10 years ago in 2009, over 10 years ago. Um, and they're asking it for it to be renewed just as it is. Oh. Uh, but there doesn't, it doesn't need to be for 10 years. It's, it's not a criteria of the 1041 permit that it be for 10 years. Hmm. Um, and the commissioners can, the three commissioners can vote uh, to deny the permit based on uh, the, the permit criteria that they're, they're not being met. And you mentioned the phrase junior water right. And I made the mistake once of starting a conversation with somebody about water rights in Colorado and never really got um, the three hours of my life back and <laughs> never really fully understood it. So. Let's just say that, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know what a junior water right is in uh, the state of Colorado, um, you're, you're sitting at a computer right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> unless it's something that can be simply explained in five seconds or less. Fair yeah. enough? Political and social justice signs were stolen in Buena Vista the night of Thursday, October 8th. The trespass and thefts occurred after dark, starting around 8 o'clock p.m. No fewer than 75 signs were vandalized and stolen. At least 75 signs were recovered on CR-306 and CR-371 the next day, Friday, October 9. Signs recovered were Biden, Hickenlooper, and social justice messages with 53 of the signs from the Keith Baker campaign. The value of the signs stolen from the Baker campaign is a minimum of $583. In Colorado, a Class 6 felony is defined as more than $2,000 but less than $5,000, so the crimes are misdemeanors. Calls for unity are coming from our friends and neighbors. To respect one another's privacy property and refrain from trespassing could be a good start. Thanks once again for joining us, folks. We will be back again Wednesday night at 7 p.m. And now enjoy some of the very best words from Donald Trump. You know, I do have a hard time because I am more about smaller governments. And so it is a concern to uh, see that we're expanding yet again another area of our government. You know, I do have a hard time because I am more about smaller governments. And so it is a concern to uh, see that we're expanding yet again another area of our government. You know, I do have a hard time because I am more about smaller governments. And so it is a concern to uh, see that we're expanding yet again another area of our government. You know, I do have a hard time because I am more about smaller governments. And so it is a concern to uh, see that we're expanding yet again another area of our government.